Hello, my name is Daniel, and I'm a member of the Western Library Youth Advisory Group. Today, I will be interviewing Mary Louise Ashburn as part of the Western Library Centenary Project. Mary Louise Ashburn is a longtime resident of Weston and a member of the Weston Historical Society. So, welcome, Mary Louise Ashburn. Thank you for coming today. Thank you very much, Daniel, for inviting me. So, for your first question, how long have you lived here? In Weston? Yes. All my life. All my life. And I've just had my 80th birthday, so that's how long. So, what are your earliest memories of living here? Uh, here in Weston? I lived on, I, um, I remember living on King Street, that's my earliest memories, in my grandmother's house, and it was at uh, 88 King Street. Now, that's at 74 now, because they renumbered the, the houses on the street. But then uh, my parents built a house over on Joseph Street, almost directly behind my grandmother's house, and that's where I grew up. And I met my husband at uh, Brookie and Kodak, as a matter of fact, as a summer student, and uh, after we married, he decided he liked Weston too, so we ended up buying a house on Church Street. So I tell people, I lived in my grandmother's house, and then I lived in my parents' house, and then I lived on Church Street, and if you drew a line as the crow flies, it's just from one walk to the next to the next. All my life I've lived in this. So, how long have you been using the library here? Well, I think I got my first library card when I was six years old, and that's when I would be in grade one, and we were learning to read, and we were encouraged to come down to the library and get our first cards, and then we could borrow books from the library. But I have to admit that my recollection of the selection of children's books was a very, very small collection. Now, I'm not sure if it was because there was a limited number of children's books for small children who would be, say, six years old, because as I, I got a little bit older, there were wonderful books for the, uh, children who were 9, 10, 11, 12. But for the young children, it wasn't much. It was mostly, I want to be a fireman, or I want to be a nurse, and then they talk about what you would do if you were going to be that, and that wasn't really as exciting. But I have had a card since I was six years old. So, Ms. Lee, what function has the library played for you as you've grown older in Weston? Oh, I've always had a library here. And I, I like to read. Reading is like breathing to me. And I, I like to read. There's been all sorts of books. And it isn't just one type of book that I like. And the library has always had a, a great selection. Now, in the early years, of course, you, you took your selection as it was because this was the Weston Public Library. Once we got into the amalgamated libraries and you could get books from other libraries and just put in your order. That greatly expanded the ability to get a book, so that I have to say that it is an advantage to be part of the big library system. But always Western Library had done a very good selection of books, and I think our librarians were very progressive and knew what books were the most recent books and uh, got them into the library and part of the system. I, 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 it's always been an important part of my, my life. So, has this role that the library has played for you changed over time, even though it has been important for you, or has it stayed for you the same? Oh, well, I, I, would, I would say it's changed in the sense that, that you can get a much broader uh, range of, of books, as I did, just explained. But, um, I, would say, I don't know, it's still, it still retains its very big importance to me to be able to come into my library, and I would write because it's my library, <laughs> because I, I've been associated with it for so long and to be able to just browse through the shelves. And there's always something to get. So I, I, I regard it as, as having changed, but not changed. So library staff have told us that you had found memories of a particular librarian. Could you tell us more about Mrs. Rothery? Her name was Ruth, and she was a lady that was, was uh, very uh, sort of lean and wiry in build and had red hair, as I recall. It was always said, sort of standing on end. And she would, she watched over the children. If, if you were taking out a book that she thought wasn't suitable, she'd say, oh, I don't think you'd like that book. And it would suddenly be whisked away and she'd have something else to suggest. Now this, of course, irritated some of the kids, but always she had very good alternate selections. So that that, that sort of mitigated. There was the other point, too, that she knew what type of books you like to read, and uh, if they were giving any prizes at the school, or, 
or at the, at the church, and when they came to her, she could recommend a book I know that, that uh, this child will enjoy, and she was invariably right. Some of my very fond reading was uh, received as gifts because Ruth brought three and said, Mary Louise will enjoy this, and I still have them on my shelf. I can't say I go back and read all those books that I got when I was 11, 12, and 13, but I, I don't think I ever part. They were special. What about any of the other stuff do you remember? Uh, the, well, Olive Nichol was, was uh, Ruth Rothery's assistant, and she she was uh, almost as good as Miss Rothery in, in knowing what she'd like to read. But Miss Rothery was always the one that was in charge, but Olive Nichol was, was, was a very nice person, and she was, uh, she, she'd never take a book away from me. If she was at the desk, you know, you could, <laughs> you could take out the book if you wanted to take out the book. She wouldn't stop you. Ruth Rothery was a little bit more, uh, uh, a little tougher. <laughs> but both these were very nice. Very nice. And now, when, when we got into the amalgamated system, I think they changed librarians much more frequently than, than uh, they did when it was just the Western Public Library because uh, the librarians tended to stay. There wasn't really a, another library that they wanted to do to stay. So I didn't know, I, and I can't say I do know the libraries as much today. I recognize faces when I come in, but uh, I, I don't know them quite the same way as I did with these others. So going back a bit to your beginnings in Western theory, like, what were the shops around here? Like, what was it like your for businesses? Oh, oh West, Weston was the hub of everything. Weston was the center of the universe. But I, joking aside, Weston was a complete small town, and we were surrounded by fields, farmers' fields, and you knew where Weston started, Weston stopped, and uh, you if you went uh, past Jane Street. There were farmers' fields. If you know, if you know your area from Jade Street over, and you go across Lawrence, and it's all built up, farmers' fields. You can't imagine, I'm sure, what it was like. You go across the river, and there was, uh, it was once again, Etobicoke was very rural, all farmers' fields. It wasn't until after the war that uh, they began to build the subdivisions. But when I was growing up in West, you knew exactly where the town was because it was always surrounded by fields. And it's ended, it started and stopped, and you just knew where you were. We were in Weston. And the stores were great. Absolutely great. Everybody came into Weston to do their shopping. And we had great stores then. And be, because it, uh, they had a, a lot of commerce here. Everybody came to Weston. Weston was, was at the economic hub. And then what changed were the, when they introduced the uh, classes. And when they started building up the subdivisions. Then the subdivisions had their own classes, and then people began to shop other places. And then, I think 1964, they built Yorkdale, and the selection there was so great that an awful lot of people did their shopping that you would do on the main street. I mean, I'm not talking about your supermarkets, I'm talking about your stores that people went in to get shoes and to get clothes and things of that nature. Um, they shopped elsewhere. And that's when Weston began to. Be not quite the town that it can't be as far as the commerce was concerned. So I understand that there was a time when Western Library was to be torn down. Yes. Could you tell us a bit more about what role you played in keeping it open? Well, the school board, in their wisdom, knew that it was, was overcrowded. They knew that there wasn't enough space. And they looked at the space and they thought, you know, wouldn't it be nice if we got a grant and we built a beautiful library with glass and steel and things like that. Everybody would love that. It'd be very modern. And uh, once again, I, Marjorie Campbell uh, was a school teacher and she was a wonderful lady, actually. Very bright, very capable. Her father had been a school inspector and she said it would be a dreadful thing to tear down that library. And so she planted the seed and people said, you know, Marjorie is right, absolutely right. We should not allow that building to be torn down. And so petitions were taken up, and the town wrote letters. We did. I urged everybody to send a letter to the to the school board. And we, I remember standing on the church steps across the way here with my clipboard and having people sign the, the petition saying, do not tear down our library. We agreed that it needed to expand. 
but we did not want the initiative of the Carnegie Library to be torn down. So I, I, I was I was part of that. Well, then they thought they should have a a, a corporate being to to give status to say that the, the uh, Western Historical Society is opposing, rather than saying a, a large number of the citizens are opposing. So that's when the, West, the Western Historical Society was formed, and it was formed because of the desire to retain the library. And that's where it began, and it was, in a way, a very good thing. Not only did we save the library, but the Western Historical Society has continued to do good things here in the community ever since. Well, I, I, but I was part, I was part of that, but I, I, I'll give all credit to Marjorie for leading the, the, the charge, if you will, <laughs> to save the library. So what physical changes have you noticed to a library over the past years? Well, of course there was the addition itself, and uh, that people looked at and said, why don't they make the addition look like the old library? And the answer that the architects came up with, and which is, I think, accepted to a certain degree that still, is that we don't want to detract from the old library. We want people to look at it and recognize it as, as it was. And the new library is to be recognized as a new section of the library. And we blend them so that they uh, can, can move from one to the other very easily. And we'll save what all we can of the old library. And, uh, uh, but, we feel that it's better to have a new look with the addition from the book of the library. So you, when you come along to our, our library, you know that there has been a modern addition added because it looks different, and that was fine. Well, then they did renovations, and so they, uh, one of the things they did, which was wonderful, they had, they had been in, in a drop ceiling with, with white asbestos tiles in the old library which was, you know, we just have sort of accepted it. They took it down and they found that wonderful, wonderful wood ceiling that, that is, is I, and we just, just looked at it and thought, why would anybody cover it up? Well, of course, it was to save the heat, you see. We bring it to the ceiling down and the heat does not uh, sort of float up <laughs> so high and it costs less and things like that. But that was one of the wonderful things they, they did when they did the renovations on the old library. And they very cleverly kept the base, the old library, the, the walls are all there. Now they, they uh, I think they had covering with, with shelving and things like that. You hadn't been quite so aware of them, but I think they did a lovely job on that. Now one of the stories I like to tell is about the doors. And the doors to the old library, of course, were not going to be opened. They, because there was a new entrance that is built on. And so they were not going to open those doors. Now, they had previously, in Weston, they had changed the original doors uh, into heavy glass doors, which nobody really cared for. Then, when the library board was doing their, their uh, renovations, they put big, heavy, windowless doors, because they said nobody was going to go in there, so we don't need to get any light, it just leads into a, uh, a stairway. And uh, the Historical Society, Said we will raise the money, and I think it raised maybe about twenty-seven or twenty-eight hundred dollars. And we commissioned a local artist by the name of Colleen Dodds, who uh, does stained glass and lead paints. And the uh, dummy moon window above the doors was done by Colleen. And the doors themselves, we talked to uh, one of the uh, woodworking teachers at a, a local school. And he was very enthusiastic about the project, and they did it with his class. They did all sorts of research and uh, looked at the pictures, and they measured and, and uh, came up with the doors as they are. And that door and doorway is as close to the original as we could come. So we, we were restoring, at the same time as they were restoring the interior of the, the library, we thought that was our contribution to the exterior. So those doors that you see that nobody uses because they're not doors anymore in the sense that they're an entranceway into the, into the library, uh, those doors are just as close to the original doors as we could possibly come from. So I'm very proud of that. I think that was one thing that was well done with the Historical Society contributed. So I understand that you at a Western Historical Society have used this room here for presentation. Could you tell us more about that? Oh, yes, of course. Uh, one of the things the Western Historical Society has done is to gather pictures and to do research. 
And Weston has a wonderful story. Absolutely wonderful story. And so we have uh, been asked on occasion if we would put on a, a, a show. Now, we used to call them slideshows, and we used to use the little 35 millimeter slides. You don't do that anymore. Now you have your computer and a PowerPoint presentation. So we've moved into that. I, not myself so much as my very good friend, Jerry Hurst, who is very accomplished technically. So, but we have worked together and uh, we tell the story of Weston because we think that's part of uh, finding your roots in your new community for everybody. If you haven't grown up in Weston, maybe you'd like to know about the community you've grown, that you have become part of since you moved here. And uh, Jerry is, now she laughs at me because I say she's a newcomer. She's been here for 30 years and she thinks she's maybe not a newcomer anymore. But in any case, uh, learning about West and what the community was like and looking at the pictures. And you know, some of the buildings on the main street are still those same buildings that we find in our pictures that were taken maybe a hundred years ago. And that, that really pleases us. It pleases us very much to think that there are vestiges of the old community still here, still being used, still part of our lives, and we'd like people to know that. And so we have uh, developed slideshows, we've developed a number of slideshows, and we have shown them here in the library from, from time to time uh, on invitation. And we, we have uh, a, number of, a number that people have come and enjoyed. Uh, we don't have our meetings here because uh, we would have to leave the library by 8.30 and our meetings run a little longer than that. So we would find that we were very poor uh, uh, tenants here in the, in the library. I think the librarians would get tired of that. But we do uh, enjoy sharing what we have, and what we've accomplished over the years and what we've accumulated so that we can tell the story a bit about Weston. And we have a number of slideshows that we would be very pleased to share with people here at Western Public Library, and this is the room we do it in. So, I, I've done it with a, a, a former member of the Western Historical Society, Marjorie Mossman, and I. We used to do slideshows here many years ago, and now I do the same with uh, Jerry Hurst. And uh, uh, we feel that this is important. This is part of being Western, and this is the heart of Western. So it's very, very appropriate. And you also mentioned that there are some original buildings here. Yes. Do you have any special memories of when you were younger, any of the businesses that used to be in those buildings? Oh, yes. Uh, for instance, where Pizza Pizza is now, that was Inch's drugstore. And the Inch's were, if they'd been in business for a long time, one of the things that they had was, it was a, a soda fountain counter where you could go and you could have Sundays or you could have, have sodas. And uh, with, with ice cream in, uh, I don't know if people have sodas anymore, but there would be ice cream with a, a, a ginger ale or a, a, a soda base. And it was very good. Uh, at one of the events, every year when you started school, you had to buy your school books. And the drugstore and squibs uh, would uh, get in a large supply of the books. They would know ahead of time what books were going to be needed for grade one and for grade two and grade three and right on up into high school, and they would lay in supplies of these books. And then everybody would, after the first day, and you got your list of books, you'd rush down and buy your books at either inches or at squibs, one or the other. And so, uh, you know, this was this was part of our education in the, in the community. I remember that very well. I remember a shoe store and that uh, we went to. Oh, dear, I forgot the name. But one of the things they had was the x-ray machine. Now, they don't do this anymore, but this was a wonderful thing that you stood on. The, uh, like, it was like a scale, scale, a weigh scale. You looked in, in here, you looked down, and they pushed a button, and you could see, it was sort of a fluorescent green, you could see all the bones in your toes. And the idea was that you would be able to, they would be able to fit you better because if they could see where your toes were. Well, now, I don't suppose that was very good for your... <laughs> Feet in the long run, but at that time, this was the latest in technology that, that you looked down and you could see x rays of your feet. Maybe that's why I wore these shoes, which are orthopedic shoes. But in any case, they, things like that. Uh, there was a, a, a jewelry store, Mr. Jordan. Mr. Jordan was a very fine jeweler, and he had, had not a very big store, but he was a wonderful man that would do anything and have suggestions. And I can remember getting some. some uh, 
pearls, restrung that, that uh, had been given to me and were very special and the string had broken. And uh, Mr. Jordan looked after that. But he was a, a very, very interesting person to talk to. And he was down pretty close to the Eagle Mall, uh, the Eagle Manor, where they did snow. Oh, and you can, and then there was a meat shop, and that, that you went in, and you, you always bought your meat at the butchers, and the butcher cut off meat. They, 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 we didn't have the, the, the packaged meats the same way. Uh, we always had went to the butcher for fresh meat, and they, no, these I, I think it must be pretty tough being a butcher. You know, they have a, a deli in all these uh, uh, supermarkets, but it's uh, this was an individual butcher shop that you would just went to. So there were things like that, but then the dresses, we had several very nice dresses, uh, dress shops. The Wise Doors was one of the best, uh, and uh, then they Marcy Mac, and they, and you, you, they, where you could get clothes that would fit any uh, size and would fit any occasion. So that we were we were very well served with our, our business section. Very nice, very well. I might also say, you know, we see it Weston as a, a community of high rises, all along the Humber River, high rises. Those were the, the prime places for the biggest and the best homes in Weston. And if you had been here when I was a child, which was a little hard to imagine, but the fact remains that all along the, the Humber River, overlooking the river, were the, the very finest of the homes in Weston. And because they had large lots, and they have a wonderful location over the river. That's where the high rises have been built. So we, we lost a lot of, of handsome architecture. Now this this is the way the world goes and progress, and then certainly a lot of people have found homes there. But those were all beautiful houses. We've got pictures of them. You know, that's what was along the river. So West West has changed. That's all right. West has changed, so is the rest of the world changed. So, you know, you get used to it. Uh, and you can think. That we what we have with many things that are better. Some things we regret, but you have to go for. So which landmarks are under as the historical society help to preserve? Well, I, we're not a preservation society as far as houses is concerned. We've preserved a lot of, of materials, a lot of pictures, uh, a lot of artifacts we've got, but we're not a, a, Preserving houses. However, we have joined in and assisted the architectural uh, conservation of certain buildings, and there is a, a designation called the Ontario Heritage Preservation designation that the building is a heritage structure. And if you're designated under the Ontario Heritage Act, then this provides a very special protection. The library, for instance, outside the library here, you'll see a sign, and the sign says. This is, this is a designated building uh, up at 64 King Street. That was the home of William Tyrrell. And William Tyrrell was the first reeve of Weston. It is a very, very large home and on a large piece of land, and we, we hope it will be preserved. But it is a beautiful building in a, in a, in a Georgian Revival style, and it also has a sign. It has been designated under the Ontario Heritage Act. So, that we have done that and encouraged this and provided information for, uh, at the present time, we are uh, assisting the uh, Heritage Conservation District Committee with uh, research and assistance on identifying houses. And this is, in a way, it is, is even bigger than individual houses because it, it talks about preserving the streetscape and large sections of the town. It's a much more difficult thing to achieve, but it is is going part of it. There's the first phase is being done, the second phase is being researched, and we hope when we get through that Weston will be known as a conservation district for people say, you know, our community is is very special and it is in a way protected under under the uh, Ontario Heritage Act, and uh, it will keep it as a special place and not. Not allow it to be changed too radically because it is so nice to live here. So, I know the majority of Weston is on the east side of the river, but can you tell us a little bit more about the where Weston on the west side? Yes, of course. Uh, we were talking the history, the earliest years of Weston, because Weston grew up as a mill town. 
Now there was uh, up at the north end of town where the St. Phil's Bridge is located today. There was a mill uh, dating from about 1817, we think, and it was built by a man by the name of Joseph Holly. And Joseph Holly built what we call a mill complex. And involved in that mill was a grist mill, which is where they ground the grain into flour. There was a sawmill for making making uh, planks and uh, for house building and making big, big beams. Uh, there was a, a general store and there was a distillery where they the old grain that they turned the grain into alcohol. And there was a, a, also a tavern. And so all these things went together and because Men were employed at the mill. There were men supplying services. There was a, a cooper. Now, a cooper made barrels. And everything was sent by barrels. They, we have boxes. But then they, they put things in barrels. And so they were, there was a special uh, um, uh, occupation was uh, being a cooper because you made the barrels. You also made the small wooden things, wooden buckets and, and dippers and things like that that uh, households needed. And then there was the man that took the, the hides, and there was a tanner, there was a tannery, and there was uh, a number of services for the mill. There was always a blacksmith close by because, of course, they had horses. They also had wagon wheels that would have to be replaced, but the horses and the horseshoeing. And so around the mill, there grew up a little mill village. And this is the same story that is true of, of all the small towns in early Ontario. They, they all grew up around the river, they all grew up around the mill. And uh, because the, the mill buildings were on the west side of the river, and there was a, sort of a, um, a plain in the river. Now we look at it today and we can't imagine that they actually have houses down on the, the, the lower level of the, the river there, but they did. And uh, so this, that's where the first community of Weston now, there were always some on the west side, but not concentrated around the, uh, the mill. The mill was on the on the west side, but the, the, there was some house on the east side, but it was a high bank, and uh, there weren't so many. Uh, then, uh, there came in 1850, a flood. And we know all about floods, the damage they do in the low-lying lands. And there was so much damage done that the people decided that they had had floods before, but this was a very large flood. And so many of them said, we won't build on low-lying land anymore, we'll go on the heights, and we'll go on the east side. So they, many of them located on the east side of the river, which is the western, what we think of as the western side of the river, and it began to develop on the west side, of the river, or the east side of the river. So now, they always say it uh, Weston began on the, on the west side. There, there was nothing confusion. <laughs> I'm not getting my stuff money. But it, it, it did and it didn't. Now, they laid out lands, the, the people that owned the land, they laid them out and they had very, very uh, uh, big plans for, for sort of selling lots. But they didn't turn into it. They really didn't. If you look at the uh, development on the west side, it wasn't till much much later, that they maybe a hundred years, I think you could probably say a hundred years later, that they really began to fill in those lands. A few big houses were built on the uh, what we call the other side of the river, that is the Etobicoke side. But uh, generally speaking, the big development in Etobicoke did come after the Second World War. And they started building the subdivisions. But uh, what had been Weston uh, in that topical side, really didn't didn't thrive. Uh, it, the mill stayed on, and the the, uh, uh, the St. Philip's Church was there, and there was a, the wonderful house of the Wadsworths, which is where the golf course is. Uh, but the golf course took up a large part, and the part that was south of the golf course, it, it didn't didn't really develop until much later. I mean, the Graham's uh, Forest had a, a large spread of land along that part of the Humber, and so that took up that part of the land, but the actual building of the community didn't take place until after the second. So, can you tell us a bit more about the Western Centennial Celebration and how it impacted the community? Daniel, I certainly can, and I love to tell the story, because 
Weston was incorporated in 1881 as a village. And so when 1981 came, and we were still, when we were uh, thinking a bit ahead, we were still saying to the library board, you couldn't possibly destroy this library. This is a Carnegie library. This is very important to the town. And we're going to be celebrating 100 years since Weston was incorporated. And the library has to be here to be part of that celebration. And so, as things rolled along, uh, the Historical Society did the research. And we found there were 48 homes in Weston that it were built in eight, before 1881 or by 1881, so they were at least 100 years old. And when we found this out, we talked to the people that owned the houses, and we said, you know, we would be willing to put a sign on your front lawn and say that it was incorporated, or was part of the, the village at the time it was incorporated in 1881, because it dates from a certain date. And we provided the information and we provided the signs. And there's still some of them up if it, in Weston, but you know, things don't last forever. And it, however, once those signs went up, and everybody began to look at what they previ previously thought was just an old house. This is a house with a history. This is a house that's 100 years old. This house was here when Weston was incorporated as a village. And the, the, the pride people began to take in their homes was, was just enormous. Uh, one time I, I got a call from a lady who said her home, her sign had been stolen. And she said, but my sign, I, I have to have it replaced. Well, we, we didn't know where we would start for replacing things because this time had passed on. Well, it was okay that somebody, I think, for a prank had taken it and put it behind somebody else's house and we got it back. She was delighted. And another lady at the time was very put up with us because she wanted a sign, but her house wasn't just quite old enough, but it was only two years. And I, I regretted really that we were quite so, quite so hard, but he said, no, they had to be here in 1881 when Weston was incorporated as a village and your house wasn't built till 1883. I don't think she ever forgave it. But that's, her house is still standing and it's lovely and we would certainly include it in any list. But uh, it, it, it gave an enormous boost of pride in the community to look around and say, these houses are wonderful, they are still standing, and they, uh, you know, changes occur. Sometimes there are, are changes in houses that they don't look quite the same, but the basic house, the basic house is over a hundred years old. And I think this is one thing that the Historical Society does do very well to say to people, you know, this is something for you to be very proud of and happy that we have preserved so much of our community uh, over the years, and it is a lovely place to live. We had a, a house tour uh, in the fall, last fall, and we had three houses on that tour that were 150 years old, and I think we had uh, 11 that were at least 100, and then there were another couple that were almost 100 on this, on this house tour that we had. And that's that's pretty remarkable for a community. I think Weston is a very special place to live in, and I wouldn't want to live anywhere else than it. So is there anything else you'd like to talk about for the library? Like the library? No. I hope it's here forever. <laughs> it's a, it's been a part of my life all these years, and then, so I really hope that it is here forever. It's a, it's a, a very important part of our community. And I can only say I will be vastly relieved when they get all the streets open so that people can have access to, to uh, some of these facilities. And it's been very difficult for people here at the library as well as for people who wish to use the library. I've already mentioned anything else like that. No? You think of anything else you want to know about? <laughs> I think that I've talked to you about it. <laughs> Alright, well, then on behalf of the Toronto Public Library and Western is a very group here, I'd like to thank you for coming in. Daniel, thank you very much for having me. I was speaking from the heart because I my heart is here with the library. And, and we'd like to review this other thing. Oh, my. That in my, my my box of memories. Thank you very much for having me here. Mm -hmm.